Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome. We are so happy to have you here. My name is Richard Frost, and I'm a member of the Social Sciences Committee. Our team is happy to bring you today's session. Please take out your cell phones right now and ensure they are silent so as not to distract from today's presentation. I know that on multiple occasions, I'm a guilty party in that, so I always appreciate that reminder. Also, welcome to the crowd joining via Zoom in the Hass virtual classroom. Special thanks to our course technician, David Blatt, who is very helpful in the back for supporting our hybrid modality. Are you interested in helping Hass become more environmentally friendly? If so, you're invited to join other like-minded Hass members for an introductory exploratory session in the Hass classroom next Wednesday, October 4 at 3 p.m. As another reminder, we would welcome Holocaust survivor Tova Friedman to our monthly program on Tuesday, April 10th, October 10th, at the Jack Miller Center for the Musical Arts on Hope's campus. Please note this is the second Tuesday of the month. Coffee, cookies, and conversations will begin at 9 a.m. Students, faculty, and staff of the community are also welcome. Tova will be available following the program to greet you and sign copies of her memoir. You can purchase your own from the Hope College Bookstore, Reader's World, or from the HASP office, where a limited number of copies will be available after class today. On the day before, Monday, October 9, at 3 p.m., you'll be introduced to Tova's story when we screen the documentary, Surviving Auschwitz, written by HASP member Milt Nuzma. This is a free screening at the Knickerbocker Theater and will be followed by a panel featuring the film director, writer, and producer. We hope you can join us for both these incredible events. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Cunnan. Um, Bob Cunnan was, uh, got his master's, bachelor's degree from Ferris State University. He received a master's from Western Michigan University in economics, and he went on to receive uh, his PhD from the University of California in San Diego in economic and economic theory. After that, he became chair of the Department of Economics and Business at Aquinas College for many years and developed the off-campus program plus the on-campus. So he did both the graduate and undergraduate. After a successful season there, he went to Equitable of Iowa and became one of the leading economists, econ economists and investors at Equitable Iowa. He then went on to join ING, the large Dutch firm, with uh, their investments. Um, after stepping away from there, uh, he enjoyed uh, American equity to do some of that. Bob enjoys golfing, walking, lots. He likes jokes, and every once in a while, he, he likes a glass of wine. So without further ado, Bob Cunnan. <laughs> Well, help. <laughs> Thank you. Richard was uh, vice president and dean of students uh, here at Hope for uh, 33 years, which is pretty impressive. Uh, having had some experience in uh, higher education at one point, it's pretty unusual for a dean of students to last that long and remain uh, sane. So I think that's uh, quite impressive. Um, good morning to everyone and a special welcome to those who are joining us uh, virtually. I want to thank everybody for signing up. It's not everybody who would sign up for a class on John Maynard Keynes, uh, given that most people have no clue who he is. Um, <clears throat> he is um, an individual that had a profound impact on economic thought and practice uh, going back 90 years. And um, back when he first came in, uh, we were in a period of time where everybody believed in classical economics. And that is, if you went into a serious downturn, you didn't have to worry about it because there would be automatic stabilizers, including <clears throat> lower taxes and or individuals that would step in and would invest money in projects and so forth that were not doing very well. And it would get you out of a downturn. 
And uh, when you think about it, um, in 1928 through 1932, which we experienced a pretty severe depression, uh, it ended up cause, uh, causing uh, Herbert Hoover to lose his position to Franklin Roosevelt. And Roosevelt argued that you have to do more than count on these automatic stabilizers to get you out of this mess. And the book that John Maynard Keynes wrote in 1936 was directly related to what he learned from Franklin Roosevelt, that the government has to be willing to step in when you go through a significant downturn to get us out of the situation. So I think he had a rather significant effect on uh, on a lot of different things. Um, what I would point out is that we are faced with a situation right now where we are running huge deficits. Um, this year, at the end of September, this fiscal year, we will hit two plus trillion dollars in deficit for this year. And uh, if you look at all of the stimulus payments that have been made over the last three or four years, it doesn't leave a lot of flexibility if we go through another recession in the next six to 12 months. And um, one of the interesting things about uh, um, uh, John Maynard Keynes is that his father was an economist. And one of the intriguing comments that he made about uh, John Maynard Keynes is he said at seven years of age, he was more interesting to talk to than many of his colleagues. Now, I don't know about you, but at seven years of age, my major interest was watching Ren 1010 and Fury on Saturday mornings. And uh, I remember my, my dad saying to my mother, when is he going to grow up? And uh, <laughs> as I said to my wife the other day, I found myself going back and looking at an old YouTube channel with Fury. And um, an interesting story about that, there was an uh, individual by the name of Bobby Diamond who played the role of Joey on that Fury series. He ultimately became an attorney. And uh, <clears throat> many years ago, while he was a lawyer in California, he represented a client that we were doing business with. And I had a chance to meet with him and talk with him about that series. And he told me an interesting story. He said, he started laughing. He said, you know, that horse Fury he used to bite me all the time. And uh, he said, half the time I was bleeding when I was in that series. And I, <laughs> it was just kind of an interesting story. So, <clears throat> My topic is uh, Keynes and the current uh, chaotic e economic environment. What we sh should we learn from what he wrote and the experiences he had back in the early 1930s and when he wrote the general theory in 1936? By the way, an interesting uh, side on that, uh, many years ago when I was teaching economics, I had a student who came up to me one time and said, why are you making us read this book that was written in 1936? And my comment to him was, what he talked about in that book is still relevant, and is still relevant to today. So he was the most influential economist of the 20th century, and I think he's still very relevant. The quote that I have on here from a gentleman at the University of Chicago, I think really says it uh, quite accurately. In the final analysis, we're all Keynesians in the foxhole. We may not want to admit it, but the reality is we're influenced by what he wrote and what he practiced 90 years ago. So, um, so what would, better get this here. So what would Keynes think? Well, we've seen in the last couple of years, the worst inflation that we've seen since the early, early 1980s. Now it's gradually coming down but the most recent inflation report shows that it's ticking back up again. I want to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes and, and why that could get much worse in the next year, uh, contrary to what the uh, Fed is telling us. We've had endless deficits. This year, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to hit $2 trillion by the end of September. And I think it's safe to say that we're probably going to hit another $2 trillion in the next fiscal year, given all the spending that's going on. The third thing is uh, 
the U.S. dollar is down 30% in the last five years. That has some real implications to it because when the dollar is devalued, it makes foreign goods even more expensive uh, when you buy them here in the United States. So if that continues to be the case and the rest of the world lose confidence in the dollar, it probably means that the dollar is going to be devalued even more relative to other currencies. The last thing uh, has to do with uh, 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 no current uh, economic game plan. Now, I've looked at the Biden Bidenomics uh, strategy now for the last couple of years, and he keeps talking about all the wonderful things that have come out of it. I come away with one conclusion, spend, spend, spend. And um, the idea is that the more money you spend, the happier you're gonna make people out there. And there's really not much more to it than that. The other big thing that's going on right now has to do with um, mercantilism. Um, mercantilism really talks about a situation that was uh, very evident prior to the 1930s that all a country should do is focus on their own exports. They shouldn't worry about anything else other than exporting things to other countries. And um, <clears throat> we're beginning to return back to that situation. The cooperation between countries is going down and uh, Keynes would have been very uh, appalled by uh, what was going on in that regard. I wanna mention one other thing and that has to do with the growth of government programs. This will kind of blow you away like it did me. There are now 2,200 separate government programs that are supporting various programs around the country. And it goes all the way from things like Social Security and Medicare, um, <clears throat> almost anything you can imagine. Those 2,200 programs are not going away. And as Milton Friedman one time said, any government program that has passed is not short term. It's going to become permanent. And he was dead right that uh, once you get a program in place, people do not want to see it disappear because they're dependent on getting that money from the federal government and it continues to grow. I love this uh, uh, cartoon here. It shows uh, Jerome Powell. And uh, he's saying it would have been far better if we had raised rates a little sooner. Um, you remember a couple years ago, uh, they were pumping a lot of money, and I'll show you a chart in a few minutes that uh, demonstrates what was going on. And nobody was worried about inflation. Um, and uh, you had all these subsidy packages uh, uh, that were being passed and so forth, one after another. It started with Donald Trump. And it continued right on with uh, Joe Biden. So <clears throat> one of the other things that's going on that I found very interesting, and it came out of a report that I saw this morning, is that housing starts are down substantially uh, right now. At the same time, consumer confidence has dropped precipitously. <clears throat> and individuals who rent are going to pay the price for this. Because suddenly all these landlords out there are looking at the fact that housing is becoming unaffordable. What are they going to do? They're going to raise rents. So what you're seeing across the country is that rent increases are going up substantially. People have no choice. They can't afford to buy a house. Mortgage rates are going up. You may have seen that uh, in the last couple of days, the treasury market has gotten eviscerated. Uh, the 10 year and the 30 year treasury are up substantially. Both of those are, are going to affect mortgage rates going forward. And uh, it's going to make it even more difficult for people to buy homes. So, so this is John Maynard Keynes. What people don't recognize is he studied uh, economics for exactly eight weeks uh, when he was attending Cambridge. Whoops. And uh, he never completed his degree. And I thought about this for a while and I thought, oh, wait a minute. You have a father who's an economist who was talking to you about economics. 
when he was six and seven years old. He probably knew more about economics than most of the professors that he encountered at Cambridge. And uh, so he was more interested in philosophy and so forth. And so he basically dropped out of the econ program and pursued uh, philosophy. But what's amazing is you look at the what he accomplished. He was one of the leaders of the Bretton Woods Conference at the end of World War II that put in place the International, International Monetary Fund and uh, designed a six system for fixed exchange rates. This was a remarkable achievement. Before, before that time, there was nothing like this available. And he and a few others are the ones who uh, put this together. He wrote several books, but he's probably best known for the general theory, which I had mentioned earlier. And I uh, told you a little bit about the fact that he was son of a, a Cambridge uh, economist. So <clears throat> he was probably the most influential economist of the first half of the 20th century. And as I mentioned earlier, the book that he wrote was very much influenced by what Roosevelt did in 1932 after he was elected with the New Deal. And what came out of the New Deal were things like the Works Projects Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and a number of other things that put people back to work and got us out of the uh, Depression. Herbert Hoover was never willing to do that. And uh, that's largely the reason why we had a transition to a, a new president. So he influenced a whole generation of economists. And in my judgment, has influenced economist, economists for the last 80 years. Six foot seven. That was pretty unusual for a guy back in the uh, 1930s. <clears throat> he believed that uh, having studied, uh, uh, not having studied classical economics opened his mind to different thoughts. Uh, classical economic theories, I pointed out earlier, believed in automatic stabilizers. We all found out that didn't very, work very well during the uh, Great Depression. And he recognized that early on that something was going to have to be done. So one of the other things was that at the end of World War I, he wrote a, a book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. And... Uh, <clears throat> It had to do with the peace agreement, the Treaty of Versailles, that came out of World War I. That treaty that was written at the end of World War I imposed huge sanctions on Germany. And uh, we wanted to get even. And uh, the way to do that is to uh, really make them pay for it. The problem with that is that it ultimately created an increase in German nationalism and led to Adolf Hitler coming into power, and then World War II. So he was wise enough to recognize that the Treaty of Versailles was going to cause major problems in the future. Um, there weren't many people that were prepared to take that stand at that time, but he did. I thought that was uh, pretty impressive. So some of these are quotes from John Maynard Keynes that uh, I could have come up with about three or 400 of them uh, from what he said over the years, but these are some of the most interesting ones. The difficulty wise, not so much in developing new ideas and escaping from the old ones. I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of this. You know, we have our pre preconceived notions on various things and uh, you're not open to new ideas. I thought this was very accurate that uh, you got to be willing to look at some other possibilities. The other one is the uh, by continuing the process of inflation, the government can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. That's exactly what's happened over the last few years. Real wages have gone down each of the last three years, and it's because of inflation. And uh, if we don't get that under control, this is going to continue to be the case uh, going forward. Incoherent central bank policy contributes to inflation. That little cartoon I showed you earlier, had the Fed not, had the Fed recognized that there was building inflationary pressures back in 2021 and 2022, they might have taken action a little bit sooner to get this under control. But to have eight or nine percent inflation in 2022 and into early 2023, no wonder people are in trouble. 
once doubt spreads, it increases rapidly, especially related to economic policy. Look what's happened to Joe Biden. You know, he was sailing along in good shape. Now everything he does, he gets criticized for. Now I have my differences with the Biden administration about different things than that, but he's getting clobbered on all fronts right now, regardless of what he does. And I think we see that in economic policy. When things are going well, everybody is really happy with you, but God help you if things turn. And he's beginning to experience some of that right now. This uh, fifth one, I really like this uh, quote, um, um, the inculcation of the incomprehensible, excuse me, education, the inculcation of the incomprehensible into the indifferent by the incompetent. Uh, you know, you think about, uh, I think back to some of the classes that I took in, in uh, graduate school or even beyond that, every once in a while you'd wonder who in the world is teaching this class? Um, and then I thought, well, wait a minute, I was teaching some of this myself. Are they saying the same thing about me that um, maybe I don't make uh, totally good sense either? The markets are moved by animal spirits and not by reason. Well, you can see that even today. Um, if you invest in the stock market and other things, it doesn't take much to cause the market to move a lot. And uh, we're experiencing some of that right now. The last one I really like, when my information changes, I alter my conclusions. What do you do? And uh, I thought that was uh, particularly accurate uh, given some of the things that we see today. So <clears throat> I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there were a couple of uh, quotes from his book that I think are uh, very rele uh, relevant to today. And uh, we're still dealing with this about the inequality in terms of the distribution of wealth. It's actually getting wider right now. The individuals who are at the upper tiers of the income are doing really well. And everybody that's down below is not doing as well, uh, particularly given the fact that real incomes have gone down each of the last three years. And he talks a little bit about this, uh, that um, <clears throat> there was a view back in the 1930s that you had to be very careful about taxing wealthy people too much because they were providing the capital that was gonna provide all the growth going forward. Well, that's curious because we're hearing the same argument today. You gotta keep tax rates low for individuals that are earning a million or 15 million or $30 million a year, because they're gonna provide the capital that's gonna provide this growth going forward. And Keynes would say, that's crazy. Um, you gotta set tax rates high enough on upper income people to provide money for all these government programs that are gonna support people going forward. And <clears throat> that's what I'm amazed about is that he was talking about this back in the 1930s. We have the same problem today in 2023 that he saw back in the uh, 1930s. So he says that the state will have to exercise a guiding influence on the propensity consumed partly through the scheme of taxation and partly by fixing the rate of interest and partly perhaps in other ways. But he talks a little bit about the fact that we got to be willing to make some of these kinds of changes to create a proper employment situation for people here in this uh, country, or with, uh, even the people that were in uh, Great Britain. So he finishes in this one area saying that, um, that the inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes was very distorted in the 1930s. And I would argue the same thing is true today that we have not done a very good job of providing for equality of income. And all you have to do is to look at all the different things that are available to wealthy people in terms of reducing their taxable income. I mean, literally, um, I see a lot of these programs on a regular basis. You can do all kinds of things to get your taxable income down, particularly if you have a good tax accountant. And uh, I think that's part of the problem that we're faced today, facing with 
today with in terms of being able to generate enough revenue to reduce these uh, deficits. So I'm gonna move on beyond uh, this. Uh, whoops. What happened here? I can't get it to move forward. Oh, okay, here we go. So this is uh, some information that um, is uh, relevant to today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the inverted yield curve in just a second, but excess savings that were generated in the pandemic are disappearing. By the end of October, all of the XX savings that uh, occurred in 2021 and 22 and 2023 will be totally gone. And the normal savings that people have have also gone down substantially. So the, the thing that propelled the economy over the last couple of years, one of the big things, will be totally removed. The recent uh, data suggests that consumers are maxed out on credit cards. We've now exceeded $1 trillion in terms of credit card balances. And many of those credit card balances have interest rates on them better than 20%. So people are faced with a real interesting situation. And one of the things that's going on is that uh, I just noticed the other day that um, they're telling uh, credit rating agencies that they're probably not going to be able to include medical debt any longer in how they evaluate the credit rating of consumers. Well, that's interesting. Does that mean that they're going to encourage people to borrow even more on top of, on top of what they already own? Doesn't that uh, create even a more dangerous situation going forward? <clears throat> Seven million men have left the labor force in the last three years. They've just disappeared from the rolls. And one of the things that that does, it creates an artificially low number unemployment rate. If you would put that number back in, the unemployment rate would probably be higher. Now, one of the questions I ask is, how are these people surviving? I mean, if you've left the labor force and you're no longer working, you gotta be getting a subsistence payments or something else to be able to support yourself. Credit ratings continue to decline and um, across the board, there's too much excess leverage. Mortgage rates are increasing. Mortgage defaults are increasing. Corporate ratings are decreasing. And bank solving, solvency rates are decreasing. All of this is going on right now. And uh, it, it creates a scenario as to what's going to happen over the next year if we continue to see these trends. So I talked a little bit about an inverted curve. Essentially what that means is that short rates are higher than long rates. So if, if you have a one-year treasury or a one-month treasury or a two-year treasury, those rates are gonna be higher than the 10 and 30-year treasuries. That's an inverted curve. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> it means that the Fed is tightening considerably. They're driving up short-term rates to slow the economy down. And invariably, that causes some problems in terms of economic activity uh, going forward. And generally, about 90% of the time when there's an inversion, we're going into a recession. Seven of the last eight recessions have occurred when there's been an inverted curve. Only one time has that not happened. And the inversion was relatively minor. It was not that much the difference between the short rates and the long rates. So why haven't we seen that happen yet? Well, we're beginning to see it now. Based on that data I just showed you a little bit earlier on all the things that are going on with corporate ratings, um, consumer ratings, and so forth, excess savings have kept people out of trouble. They've been using that to support their lifestyle, kind of makes sense. 
use of credit cards. We're now, we now exceed a trillion dollars of credit card debt. How much longer are people gonna be able to do that? Deficit spending. I'll show you some numbers in a, a few minutes about the size of the deficits that we've accumulated in the last eight years compared to what we had before. So the best estimate is that we could have a recession by March to July of 2024. And uh, based on what I see, if you look at all the people who are predicting this, the odds are about 75% that that's gonna happen. Um, it may happen sooner than that based on some of the numbers that I'm seeing, but uh, right now it seems to be more likely the first half of next year that these problems are gonna develop. I wanna show this to you and I apologize for throwing up a, a Phillips curve on you, but it's one of the things that the Fed looks at. They wanna get us down to a 2% inflation rate. I mean, Jerome Powell has been pretty clear about that. Don't worry so much about the uh, what the unemployment rate is. It may be that uh, it's not 7%, could be lower than that. But to get down to a 2% unemployment rate, excuse me, an inflation rate, you're going to have to be willing to accept a much higher unemployment rate. Right now, that doesn't seem to be the case. And the Fed's looking at this saying, if 2% is our target, we got to figure out a way to drive the unemployment rate considerably higher from where it is right now. And uh, that may mean that they're going to have to raise rates even further in the next six months. Right now, they're on pause because they want to see what develops. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't see some significant rate increases going into the last couple of months of the year and into early uh, 2024 to get that inflation rate down to 2%, if indeed that's their real target. They said this over and over again, we want to get down to 2%. I would argue that the most recent data suggests that inflation's headed back up again. Uh, and if that's the case, they're going to have to get, even get more aggressive in terms of raising rates in the uh, future. I talked to you a little bit about what's going on with the uh, the excess of uh, saving excess savings. You can see on this little chart here that during the pandemic, in that shaded blue area, went sky high. We went up to two point one trillion dollars. People were not traveling, so they were not spending, and uh, so people were built a really big cushion in terms of their savings. Look what's happened though. Right now, in the latter part of, uh, excuse me, the, half, the first half of 2023, we were to, at 900 uh, billion. Whoops. By the end of the October, that's totally gone. There will be no excess savings left. At the same time, when you look at personal savings, you can see it with this uh, darker blue line. That's uh, headed negative right now. So people are drawing down more and more on their personal savings to support their lifestyle. And my comment about that is, where do we go from here? If there are no excess savings left and personal savings are going down, how are we gonna get through a downturn? And uh, I don't have a good answer for that uh, at this point in time, uh, but uh, it, it has some pretty ominous uh, implications to it. And the reason why it does is think about this. If we're running those kinds of huge deficits right now, and we've had all these stimulus packages the last three or four years, what is the probability that Congress is gonna pass more stimulus packages? What I see right now is they're talking about a government shutdown because they wanna cut spending. Do you think that the Republicans in the House are going to be willing to support another stimulus package that's going to drive the deficit even higher? I just don't see that happening right now. So 
here's some important questions regarding Keynesian theory. How would Keynes react to the current chaotic economic environment? Would he be a fan of the Federal Reserve policy? How would he feel about fiscal policy and endless deficits? What would he envision going forward? Well, we can This kind of gives you an idea of the situation we got ourselves into. You go back and you look at the uh, growth of the money supply, M2, which is the broadest way of measuring the money supply. And you look at the consistency going back to 2013. I mean, kind of, kind of rolling along here, everything is great. The interest rates are relatively low. And we get to uh, 2020 and the money supply goes up significantly. We were growing the money supply for a while at 26% plus as we got into the early stages of the pandemic. And surprise, surprise, if you do that coupled with the supply shortages, suddenly you get all this inflation. And uh, people were warning the Fed about this back in 2021, this is going to cause a problem. And they just, frankly, they just chose to ignore it and assumed that it was not gonna be an issue until they woke up one day and said, we got a problem um, with supply shortages and all this money circulating in the marketplace, it's gonna drive prices up. And sure enough, we ended up with an inflation rate of eight or 9%. So now you see a situation where they're reducing the money supply pretty quickly and we're beginning to see the results of that right now. I love this chart. This is our federal deficit. We're now at 32 plus trillion. <clears throat> if you go back to the beginning of 2023, we were at roughly 31 trillion. Uh, we've increased to $2 trillion in this particular fiscal year. By the way, uh, just so you're aware of this, if you look at that number up top there, the 247,000, that's your share of the federal deficit. So if you'd like to write a check to the federal treasury, they would very much appreciate it. <laughs> but it just shows how much that has grown over the last uh, few years. I also think this is interesting. This is our trade imbalance. Uh, <clears throat> Now well, I got to get the right number here. This is a money supply, but um, with China, it's about uh, 411 billion dollars. We're importing a lot more from China than we're exporting to them, and uh, that poses some interesting challenges uh, uh, for our economy. I'm sure you've heard of the Inflation Reduction Act. This was passed a couple of years ago by the Biden administration. Uh, the idea is that, was that we were gonna hire all these IRS agents, that we're gonna do all these audits and so forth, and we're gonna raise all this revenue. At the same time, they had a provision in there that dealt with the um, <clears throat> green energy. They had put a number in there of about uh, 390 billion for the cost of green energy initiatives going forward. Well, within the last two months, the OMB, Office of Management and Budget of the uh, Congress, came out and said the real cost of that program is 1.3 trillion. Yeah, go ahead. I have to inject uh, a perspective that the previous two administrations of this administration added a gigantic rolling forward debt uh, structure with a uh, what would, would appear to be a, a very expensive uh, war in the wrong direction and also with a gigantic gigantic tax cut program which also both of those increase the deficits and as those programs roll forward those numbers are actually larger than anything that's been done in the last three years under the biden administration 
I don't disagree. Uh, the, uh, my point so is it's that, cumulative, not just the last three years. No, no, I agree. Uh, uh, this happened back during the Trump administration as well. And I, I'm not trying to to put the total responsibility on the Biden administration. My bigger problem is that nobody seems to be addressing this situation. Um, I don't hear people talking about how we're going to get this under control. And if you end up with more and more deficits going forward, that reduces the capability of the government to do various things. Right now, the interest cost on our federal debt is $500 billion a year. If we're running a $2 trillion deficit, 25% of that deficit is related to the interest cost on these treasuries and so forth. No question, but that, that has been a, that looking the other way on the national debt to get programs passed that you want has started way back even in the Reagan administration. So this is a snowballing thing that has been made worse by recent administrations and it does keep on increasing. Absolutely. And, and uh, you can take that a step further. If you go back to uh, 2009, mm. our national debt has increased by three times since 2009. Since 2016, it's increased by about $8 trillion. And you look at how fast it's growing and how much of the debt payments, the debt service payments, are part of the overall budget, if we continue on at this pace, that's going to reduce our flexibility. At the same time, it's affecting the confidence that other countries have in our currency and our management. And uh, it's one of the reasons why we're having all this dollar devaluation in that. I'm not arguing about all these programs and things like that. I'm just saying that nobody seems to be unusually concerned about this. I think there seems to be an attitude, don't worry about it. You know, we'll, we'll get it taken care of. And my question is, how are you gonna do this? I have written letters, uh, not only to our two US uh, senators from uh, Michigan, but also to a number of other senators around the country. Most of the time I don't get an answer. Every once in a while I get a form letter saying, thank you for your comment. And if we want more information, we'll get back to you. Well, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I even wrote a letter to the president. I didn't even get a form letter back. So my problem is, is that <clears throat> what I see is a snowball effect. And, um, and I don't see anybody totally concerned about this. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what, uh, China really provides an interesting example. Uh, in the last day or two, uh, the largest property developer in, Ch developer in China missed another bond payment. A uh, company is called Evergrande. And uh, China has a huge deficit and has finally caught up with them. So when everybody is so concerned about China right now, I look at their, their fiscal situation and I think, well, wait a minute, they got even more problems than we do. And uh, how are they going to extricate themselves from this situation? I mean, they're, they're off uh, providing financial support to all these other countries and so forth. That's going to come to an end in a hurry, uh, given their situation right now. And there are two or three other big property developers behind uh, this Evergrande who are in danger of getting into the same situation in uh, China. But that's happening in the U.S. right now. We're seeing more and more uh, companies that are in property development and so forth getting into some serious financial trouble. And it goes back to this point I made earlier about the excess of leverage that we have in our economy. And um, <clears throat> until we get a handle on that, the risks are growing. If we get into a serious downturn, how are we gonna get out of it? Are we gonna pass another stimulus program? and raise deficits even more. Uh, I think it's highly unlikely that anything like that is gonna go through. So I don't see the flexibility that we have compared to what we've had in the uh, past. I'm sorry. Are you gonna tell us what Keynes would do? Yes. <laughs> as soon as I come up with good explanation. <laughs> so. 
I wanted to show you this uh, chart here on the devaluation of the dollars, uh, dollar. And uh, uh, Keynes would have had a real problem with this, with what's been going on since uh, 2020. You see, we had a little uptick there for a while, and we've been headed straight downhill ever since. And as I said earlier, in the last five years, we've had about a 30% devaluation of the dollar. All of that makes imported goods more expensive. And to the extent we continue to run these deficits year after year, the US dollar is gonna to continue to uh, deteriorate. Oh. So <clears throat> some final thoughts on Keynes. He would have been appalled by central bank policy, not recognizing the gathering tide of inflationary pressures. pressures. And I talk here about the multiplier effect. I want to explain that real quickly. If I were to give a dollar to you right now and you spent it, you'd spend it over here and then it would be spent over here and it would be spent back there and be spent over here. So over the course of the year, that dollar becomes worth $5. So if you have all this money circulating in the economy, by the time it goes through the different iterations, that becomes worth five or six dollars over the course of a year. And you can see what the impact of the growth of the money supply has. When I showed you that chart earlier, that the money supply was growing at 20, 26%, it actually was a lot more than that because that money is spent over and over and over again during the course of the year. And that created all that inflationary pressure. Now the money supply is going down. The Fed has learned their lesson. And they're saying, we got a big problem here. And so they're reducing the money supply very quickly. And they're trying to rein in the multiplier effect of M2. And we're seeing that right now. Consumers, on the other hand, because they had all these excess savings, they were spending. They were worried about the money supply because they had these savings. Let's take a trip to Europe. Let's go to the West Coast. Let's do other travel and things like that. Let's do home renovation, things of that nature. They don't have that capability anymore. And that's why there's some danger over the next year as to what the impact of the reduction in M2 and the multiplier effect, the elimination of excess savings and the personal savings rate headed straight downhill. How do we get ourselves out of a situation if we have real contraction in the economy. Will a Republican administration pass another stimulus package? I want to be very optimistic about that right at the moment. And, and um, it's not likely we're going to see a tax decrease if that happens. So how do you get yourself out of that situation? So you asked a question about what Keynes would do. You say, you got to pay for all these programs. Uh, you guys have been living beyond your means. You gotta be willing to either reduce expenses or increase taxes enough to be able to pay for all these programs. They were talking a little bit about the UAW strike, possible strike, actually it is a strike now, about some of the executives and so forth earning 20 million, $30 million a year I'll guarantee you that they have other tax things in place to reduce the impact of taxes and so forth. He would argue that if someone's earning a million dollars a year or $15 million a year or $30 million, they gotta pay more than 30% or 35% or 37% to be able to pay for all these programs and that. You can't just simply go on and generate these deficits forever because it will ultimately end up burning you. And we have not done that. We used to have a marginal tax rate for millionaire, millionaires that were in the 60, 70, 80% range. All of that's disappeared. I think the marginal tax rate for a lot of these people might be 36 or 37%, probably a lot lower than that when you find out all the things that they're investing in that provide the deductions against that income. He would look at that and say, this is crazy. You can't continue to do that. 
So that's one of the things that he would have uh, suggested that we got to make some adjustments in. You got to reduce expenses, or you got to be willing to raise revenue from the individuals that are, who are the best position to be able to support that. So in addition to that, he would say that political leaders have failed to recognize the imp impact of long-term deficit. And the cost of servicing that debt, I pointed out a second ago, we're spending $500 billion a year to service the debt right now. That's going up significantly. And the reason it's going up, if you look at the fact that uh, a lot of that debt we have was issued in one and two, uh, for the one and two year treasuries and so forth, all of that's been rolling over over the last six or seven months at much higher rates. A two year treasury today is better than 5%. One month and three month treasuries are in that 530 to 540 to 550 range. Two years ago, that was down lower than 1%. So we got a real problem as that debt rolls over with interest charges, uh, excuse me, debt service uh, coverage even going higher. I'm sorry? Who is holding the debt? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, the um, Of the $32 trillion that's outstanding right now, uh, something in the neighborhood of, uh, I think, 8 to $10 trillion is owned by foreigners. They're held by foreigners. The rest of that are institutions, uh, institutional investors, individual investors, um, and, um, you know, and you think about it, uh, it's been a relatively safe investment. And if you can get 5% plus on your money for two years, you might be willing to do that. The problem with that is that um, the longer they continue to do this, it may drive those uh, rates even higher than they are right now. And, and I think we've seen that here in the... Uh, in the last couple of days, the 10-year treasury and the 30-year treasury got totally eviscerated in the last couple of days. I think the 10-year uh, the treasury is up at 450 or 460. I think the 30-year 30, uh, treasury may be at 440. And I saw some reports this morning that um, there are some investors out there who believe that the 10 and 30-year treasuries will exceed 5% before the Fed is done. But the debt that's held by U.S. institutions and individuals, the debt service stays within the U.S. economy? Sure. I mean, if, uh, uh, if you're uh, being paid interest on that, you're either going to save it or you're going to spend it. Same is true with uh, foreign investors in that. Uh, you know, they, they look at other countries around the world and they think, well, the risk factor in some of those countries is even higher than what is in the U.S. But if you're buying a short-term treasuries, you know, one and two-year treasuries in that, even if you end up underwater, you know you're going to get your money back. Uh, you know, when those mature, you're going to get your principal balance back. If you buy 10-year treasuries or 30-year treasuries, yeah, if you hold them long enough, you're probably going to be all right because rates will come back down again. But I think the uh, the danger is more in the in the area that our cost of servicing that debt is going to continue to climb as a part of the budget. As I said, five hundred billion now. What happens if our uh, national debt goes to fifty billion? Uh, excuse me, fifty trillion. Um, you know, we could very easily be in a situation where we're spending a trillion dollars a year to uh, service that debt. And uh, that's gonna eliminate a lot of options in terms of the uh, programs you wanna support. So I am a little concerned about this uh, growth of uh, our debt situation. You know, you mentioned uh, you know, you've got on there political leaders failure to recognize the impact of long-term deficits. 
um, it may be that they know about this, but you know, those who pay the piper name the tune. And it's very possible that uh, our, our lawmakers in Senate and in Congress and, and in the House might be influenced by people that are making these large amounts of money and therefore would be reluctant to increase the interest rates to the levels that would be appropriate. Well, I think that I think that's fair, and uh, you know, I, I I think it's uh, it's kind of amazing when you look at institutional investors. Uh, some of them are pouring a lot of money into uh, short-term treasuries right now because they're a little worried about what's going on in that ten and thirty-year treasury market right now. I just saw a report the other day that uh, Warren Buffett had put a couple billion dollars into short-term treasuries, and his explanation was it's the safest place to go right now. Uh, do I want to put my money into 10-year or 30-year treasuries where there's a probability that those could go considerably higher? Well, it's possible that one and two-year treasuries could go higher as well if the Fed continues to increase rates. But at least they know he has a one or two-year time horizon. And to be very candid with you, I know a lot of individuals uh, that um, that I still maintain contact with they're buying a ton of one and two year treasuries. Um, a lot of them are buying CDs, short term CDs, CDs, uh, two and three or five years, because they have the same kind of fear as uh, uh, about rates going a lot higher. I wanted to make a mention um, about this UAW strike. I went back and uh, took a, a close look at all the things that the UAW is asking for in this. Oh, Jeez. Let's see well how well I handle this. What happened? Toward the end. Right there, right there. Oh, yeah, that's okay. perfect. Oh. That's not interesting. Okay, that might be a better way to go. Sure. That's sort of the front end. <clears throat> anyway, so we're seeing a uh, we're seeing uh, a situation where a lot of a lot of the buying right now is on the front end of the treasury curve, and you can understand why people are doing that when they see what's going on in the back end of the curve, the ten and thirty year treasuries. Uh, they're very fearful about that, and so you get somebody like Warren Buffett. Uh, who um, is buying at the short end of the curve. By the way, another great comment from uh, Biden, uh, excuse me, from Warren Buffett, is he was quoted recently saying that when the tide goes out, you find out who is naked. And I thought that was a great line because if things get really difficult, that's where it's going to begin to show up. The individuals who have made bad investment decisions in that they're going to get they're going to get clobbered 
and uh, he's made it clear that he's not going to be one of them. And uh, I thought that was a, a wonderful quote. So <clears throat> anyway, the uh, def uh, deficits have a negative impact in the U.S. dollar. Look at the devaluation. I've talked a little about the number of people that have uh, left the uh, workforce. And uh, I'm not clear, uh, clearly uh, sure as to uh, where these people have gone. I love this slide. Oh, I'm sorry. A comment from you on terms of the assets that are not being taxed. And if we are not too naive, we would probably believe that some of it is going back into philanthropy. But how much of that money that's accumulating on a greed basis is being taxed instead of given loopholes? Could you address that? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the numbers that I saw just uh, recently had to do with the uh, the amount of fraud that's gone on with various government programs and so forth. Uh, when they had the pay paycheck protection program, they've determined that about one of every five loans that were made were fraudulent, and uh, we've seen that uh, the government has gone in and in some cases totally eliminated the loans that were made to these companies and so forth. And they're trying to figure out which of these companies may have been involved in that situation. Whenever you have a government program, you're gonna have some of that show up where you have that fraudulent activity in that. But I think the uh, in the case of uh, individuals who have these excessive, excessive savings and things of that nature, they would have had to have paid uh, taxes on the uh, balances that they accumulated in that, but that's gone now. So, you know, whatever they uh, whatever they generated uh, through that, uh, that's no longer going to be there, and that will make things more difficult in terms of government revenues uh, going forward. I saw a number just recently about the um, what's been going on with government revenues that we're seeing it beginning to roll over and coming down again. And uh, that's a little disconcerting because it means that companies are not paying taxes to the extent they were. It means that individuals are not paying taxes to the extent. Just for a second, I want to I want to go back to the UAW proposal because one of the interesting things on that is if you look at the the package that the union is looking for, it works out to about one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars per employee that they're asking for. Uh, right now, an average uh, worker with the UAW, if you throw everything in, is about $62,000. So it's gonna more than double the cost to these companies, in the big three or whatever, if they were to get everything they want and they're asking for cost of living increases, they're asking for pension programs to be restored, they're asking for additional medical care, they're asking for a higher wage per hour and so forth. They're asking for a four-day work week. I look at that and I say, right now, it costs about $42,000 for an average U.S. vehicle. If this passes, if the companies were willing to do all of that, it would increase the average cost per automobile from fifteen to $20,000 to $20, each. So we'll go from 42,000 to 57 to 62,000. How many people are gonna be able to afford to buy automobiles at that level? So does that make the company more uncompetitive? I can. Thank you. Um, what about the piles of millionaires, billionaires who are holding money and not putting back any taxation at all that could help to defend some of this? I, I agree with that completely. That's what I alluded to earlier, that uh, you've, got a, you've got a lot of really wealthy people in this country that, um, that are building up in, uh, even more wealth. And, and I believe it's happening at the expense of individuals that are at lower income scales. And uh, I'm not necessarily um, 
wanting the government to set tax rates back to what they were in the 1950s, where, where you have 50, 60, 70, and 80 percent marginal tax rates for upper income people. But what I would say is that when I look at the number of programs that are available for wealthy people to cut their income, their taxable income, it's pretty significant. Um, you go out and buy an apartment complex or invest in real estate or other kinds of things, you can write off an incredible amount of money against your taxable income. Is that fair? Maybe not. Um, but when we have deficits like we have today, we got to figure out a way to generate more tax revenue that's going to compensate for these programs we have. You know, the reality is that those of us who are over 70, we're becoming much more of a drag on the economy. <laughs> I hate to say it that way, between Medicare, Social Security, and everything else, we're taking up a lot of government revenue. And uh, when I look at Social Security, for instance, by 2032, unless they do something, that program is going to be in serious financial situation. Well, what are they going to do? I mean, <clears throat> the suggestions that are being put forth right now is that they increase the cap. So in other words, I think it's at three or $400,000 right now. They just let it go up significantly. So individuals that are making six, 700,000 or a million or 10 million a year, they're going to pay much more into this program. And, and that may be one of the ways they have to address this. Maybe they need to consider means testing as one example. But one way or another, we're going to have to be willing to make some of those tough decisions to deal with this uh, deficit situation. Because right now, when I look at all these programs and I look at a reduction in government revenue, I can't see any way that we're going to bring these deficits down. And if you don't bring them down, the problems are going to continue to escalate down the line. We're seeing this in China right now. They got a huge problem there. Okay, We're Bob, in that situation right now. Bob, it, Bob, there's a few more questions here. Yeah. Um, I just read an article recently, I think it was in Time Magazine, that said the top 1% to 5% is paying millions to accountants in order to hide billions. <laughs> and and the lost tax revenue annually in this country exceeds 160 billion. That, that's money that's being hidden that somebody actually was supposed to pay. And, and it, it kind of deals with the last couple of things you've been talking about. But I think part of the problem is Wall Street and lobbyists and the ex exceedingly wealthy people in this country have a lot of influence over Congress who also is generally very wealthy. So the loopholes uh, keep happening. Well, that's why uh, I showed the uh, <clears throat> that uh, thing that Keynes wrote back in 1936, that one uh, paragraph. <clears throat> and uh, he pointed out that uh, uh, people believed that these extremely wealthy people were necessary in order to provide the economic capital and firepower that was going to provide relief to all of these people that were at lower income levels. And his comment was, this is crazy. Um, this is out of control, and it's going to reduce the uh, the ability to be able to help a lot of people down below. I think the same thing is true today, if not even more so. That uh, uh, when I look at all of the different ways that you can reduce your taxable income, if you invest in real estate, apartments, office buildings, other kinds of things, it's amazing the impact it has on the taxable income. And uh, as you pointed out earlier, if you have all these tax accountants and tax lawyers who are advising you on this, I'd be really curious uh, what the real marginal rate is of somebody who is earning that kind of money. I mean, we know that the, the top rate is like 37 or 38 percent. But what is the effective tax rate these people are paying? I've seen examples where in some cases, the effective tax rate for some people if they invest in certain things is zero. Mm -hmm. That's not right. 
and it's causing a, a lot of problems in terms of inequality of income and so forth. And um, um, I worry about that, that uh, we can't pay for all these programs we have. We're going to be in a real serious situation. There are several questions from the peanut gallery. Um, first one is, what do you recommend for us as senior citizens for how to respond to the economic chaos that you're describing? Could, could you hit me, hit me with that? Yes. What are your recommendations for us as senior citizens as to how to respond to the economic chaos that you describe? <laughs> I was afraid somebody was going to ask that question. <clears throat> you know, I think that... Um, you got to be willing to talk about these problems. You got to communicate. And I understand that um, sometimes you don't get very good answers from the uh, congressional representatives or senators or whatever, but it's a discussion that needs to be held. Um, part of the reason why I picked this topic is I'm getting more and more concerned about what's going on. And I think there's a, um, there's a reluctance to address this head on. And uh, what I see is uh, more and more individuals who are suggesting new spending programs and things of that nature. We can't even pay for the things we're doing right now. And uh, there seems to be a general view that we'll just add it to the deficit. Doesn't really matter. And what I'm saying is that it does matter because it has some major implications down the line if we continue to go down this path. It's going to reduce our capability of funding programs going forward if we continue to accumulate this. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be get out and talk to people. Make sure you send letters to our congressional representatives in that. Gary Peters, he gets a letter from me once a month, uh, Debbie Stabenow. And where I'm talking about these issues and so forth, and, um, and I'm going to continue to do it. I'm sending letters to other senators around the country saying, you guys got to look at this because it's becoming more and more, more and more of an issue going forward. And unless all of us collectively raise our voices, we're not going to get very far. And uh, uh, you, you got to start there. It sounded like you were uh, kind of denigrating stimulus packages. Are they counter-effective? Do they do any good? My problem with these stimulus packages is it was too much. And uh, I don't object to stimulus packages, but we had one after another. And uh, no, I believe that I believe that it provided an incentive to a lot of people just simply to not work. And um, <clears throat> that is counterproductive because then you have a shortage of people in the workforce in that is driving up wages and so forth mm -hmm. and uh, it's Too contributing to more. some of this inflationary <laughs> problem it goes back to this whole thing in the uaw now I, mm -hmm. auto workers are great i have no problem with that certainly they made major concessions the last time we had a big downturn the problem is that what they're asking for is going to have an inflationary impact not only for the auto industry but for suppliers, for others down the line, because then you get the ripple effect that everybody in other areas are going to be asking for the same kinds of things. And we're going to end up with another situation we have where we have wage spiral inflation. We've seen that before. Uh, they're going to want to reverse this three years of real wages going down. If that happens, then the Fed's going to get even more aggressive in terms of wanting to raise rates in that. So when when everybody talks today about the Fed being near the end, I look at this and I say, well, wait a minute. If a UAW gets this, suppliers start getting this, other industries start getting this, it's gonna make this inflation situation even worse down the line. So I'm not at all sure that we're near the end of the line in terms of the Fed tightening and so forth. Um, I'd be really worried that uh, unless something dramatic happens in the first half of next year, we're going to see some more rate increases. And that may cause the Fed to get even more aggressive, and they'll try to drive the economy into a recession. They won't say that. They're going to say we want a soft landing. And my comment is, 
I haven't seen too many soft landings. When they, uh, when they get aggressive enough, you're probably going to have a recession that occurs in the first half of next year. That'll drive them down to that 2% inflation target. The problem is, is that now you're going to have all these unemployed people, and they're going to have to get very aggressive then. They'll need another stimulus package. <laughs> well, that's it. You know, and again, I said, uh, at least for 2024, we're going to have continue to have a Republican Congress. There's no way they're going to pass a stimulus package. They're trying to cut expenses right yeah. now. So if that happens, how bad is it going to get? You know, could we end up with a major downturn? I don't have an answer for that right now, but I'm really worried about it. What do you think about a flat tax for these? About what again? A flat tax for these super wealthy people that have a lot of loopholes. I have a real problem with 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 how the tax code has evolved that provides all of these tax breaks. And I see a lot of these. I get approached with uh, real estate transaction all the time of people saying, you need to invest in this. The first comment is, uh, we can reduce your taxable income by this amount if you invest in this. And uh, <clears throat> well, it's, it gets my attention. And like everybody else, uh, I find that intriguing. The problem is, is that if everybody's doing that, and you can bet that individuals, uh, Mary Barra at General Motors, she makes $30 million a year. I'd like to know what her effective tax rate is. I'll guarantee you that her effective tax rate is not 37% because she's probably investing in all kinds of real estate projects and other things that's bringing that down significantly. There's something that's not right about that. So the deficit is a long range problem. It's, 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 it's been pervasive through many, many administrations. And every time the solution is to, uh, that comes up to lower taxes, there's a bunch of people saying, wow, that'd be great because then we can have, uh, I, my income will be better and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Reagan said trickle down works, which we know uh, it doesn't. And, um, uh, and then when another group comes in, They'll say, well, we want to have uh, some special programs because we need to do this and this and that. And I know it'll increase the deficit, but people are really in favor of those programs because then we can get things fixed, whether it's infrastructure or other things or, or wasting money in another place, depending upon what your opinion is. Um, so the, there's always the short term solution is always supported reduce taxes. Yay. Programs that favor what I want to do. Yay. And for administrations for for decades, nobody's really cared about the um, about the big boogeyman, the deficit, because it's not going to affect me right now. Right, it's not going to affect me in five years, probably. And for all of us here, it's not going to affect us probably at all. It'll affect our kids and grandkids. That's, but that's the, uh, correct. Yeah. So, but but that's not enough of an impetus for those people in power, whenever mm. it is to make the decisions they need to make to make this boogeyman go away. Well, and, as, I, as, and I said our, earlier, as I said to you earlier, our national debt has increased by three times since 2009. Think about that. Well, it gets worse. It, it, it ramps up because you're, 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 as your debt increases, you're servicing the debt is a bigger part absolutely. of the debt itself. But, but, but back in uh, 2009, uh, we were probably you know, less than eight or $9 trillion. We're now at $32 trillion today. Yep, we had a gigantic tax cut and program. Exactly. And then we have and COVID and all the balance imbalances. That it keeps that going up. And, and as okay, we, need, we need to kind of move on. Here's a, the, we're going to do a lightning round. The last few questions here, okay. Bob. All right, I'm sorry. I, I think what a lot of people are kind of alluding to is the fact that uh, when the Fed raises interest rates, it's designed to create unemployment. That's not a problem for your your friend Buffett. <laughs> he, he doesn't need it. You know, in some sense, the government's the entity that has to protect probably about eighty percent of the labor force. And I thought, I, in preparing for this, I, I you know, remember Keynes wrote, 
a, a interesting essay on the economic possibilities for his grandchildren. It's very right. nearly a hundred years ago. And he started out just like you started out saying, the big problem here is that the wealthy don't have an edit button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I look at Jeff Bezos is uh, soon to be, uh, if they can figure out a harbor big enough to get it out of, uh, you know, yacht. Uh, so I look at this and I say, gee, people are just saying, we need health care. We need housing. Mm -hmm. And and then with respect to the stimulus, how much of that, if it were done by a private business, would be considered investment? And, and uh, he would he would look at somebody like Elon Musk today and say, you're not paying your fair share. He would be arguing for a much more progressive tax code than we have right now. He would look at all these programs that are available for people to reduce their taxable income, and he would say, this is nonsense. You're setting yourself up in a situation for a real calamity down the line. And I think that's absolutely fair to, to say that the individuals that are in the top one or five percent are simply not paying their fair share right now. And we've got to address that head on. Um, you can't have this inequality continuing to grow and it's getting wider. Contrary to um, uh, what we think, the individuals who are in the bottom 80% or whatever, as you allude to, are losing ground to everyone else that's in that top one or 5%. And I don't believe that's sustainable. That's gonna cause a major problem down the line. And if these deficits continue to grow the way uh, I think they're probably gonna grow over the next few years, that's gonna pose more of a problem. So <clears throat> what I would say is that Keynes would be saying to all, to all of us today, you gotta get out and discuss this with people. You got to let your representatives know that this is not acceptable. You can't have just a few people sending letters uh, to these individuals saying we got a problem here. Everybody's got to do it. Okay, Bob. There's a question over here. Yeah, I'm taking you back to something you said earlier in your lecture. It had to do with uh, Keynes' re Keynes' uh, communication regarding Germany after World War II when the high amount of reparations were required from Germany. My question is, with that happening in Germany and having to pay some part of those reparations, how did they obtain so much revenue to create a huge uh, military machine that they, that they did, which was beyond compare of, rest of the rest of Europe at that time? The, the, the answer is pretty simple. They didn't pay the reparations. They did temporarily. And then it gradually went away. And uh, uh, ultimately, there was a recognition that this was not going to uh, that was not going to work. You also had a situation where German nationalism in the latter part of the 1920s was growing very rapidly. Um, <clears throat> even uh, the party that Hitler was uh, connected with was becoming much more predominant there and uh, they were beginning to build their war machine and, it, and you probably remember not remember but you read about um, about the fact that they were going into other countries and so forth and seizing assets and so forth and not surprisingly by the late 1930s we had a real problem on our hands um, and uh, probably led to uh, world war ii uh, what well, did lead to world war ii and, uh, and you look at what the result was of world war ii not only in terms of uh, the uh, war in Germany, but with the war with Japan, it caused enormous problems. People were smart enough at the end of World War II to say, we can't do that again. We can't have a situation where we're going to impose huge reparations on Germany and or Japan, because we'll be back in the same situation again 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. And I think one of the things that people often forget about was uh, how smart Keynes was in recognizing that this is going to cause a major problem. I get it that everybody wants to get even. Um, I mean, if, if you've been in a war with somebody, the last thing you want to do is to uh, provide uh, some relief to whoever you just destroyed. He was right, though, that you got to be willing to think forward about what the long-term consequences are going to be. 
I would like to certainly commend you for an excellent presentation of the problems. What I would love to hear now is some of the practical solutions that we could address besides writing letters, particularly if we're not in a position to influence the outcome all that much. Um, another course perhaps might be worth having on your thoughts about solutions. I believe that um, talking with other people about this problem and making them aware of what the consequences are is really important. It's one of the reasons why I propose this idea to the HAS program to get out in front of people and talk about this. I believe that writing letters, and I get it that, uh, I mean, I got shunned too in uh, writing these letters, that, but I'm not done. I'm gonna continue to fire off letters to uh, congressional representatives, to senators, whoever I can get in front of. The solution is we've got to get our revenues in line with what we're spending. We cannot continue to just simply put this um, on the debt ledger and assume that this is not going to have longer term consequences. When I see numbers that uh, our national debt has increased by three times since 2009, yeah, I'm astounded by that. Think about that. We had uh, we had nine or ten trillion dollars of national debt in 2009. We're at 32 trillion today. We're headed to 34 trillion by the end of uh, fiscal 2024 in September, uh, end of September next year. And we've done that in basically 14 or 15 years. So we accumulated nine or $10 trillion of debt through the first, what, 150 years or 140 years of this country. And now we are in a situation where we have 34 trillion of debt. What does that mean? Are we gonna to go to $40 trillion of debt over the next three or four years? One of the people at home is asking a very specific question that's in reference lines up with the previous question. Would you support a balanced budget amendment? <laughs> Boy, that's a loaded, uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, you know, I, I think I could probably get behind something like that if indeed they laid out how they were going to uh, address the various spending programs. There are some priorities that have to be met but there are a lot of programs. There are 2,200 programs we have right now. I, I can assure you that of these 2,200 programs, there are a bunch of them in there that don't make a lot of sense, but they just, they're there and they continue to be funded. So are you gonna be able to eliminate Medicare? Probably not. But if somebody said to me, maybe we need to have means testing for Medicare, that if you're an upper income person or something like that, you shouldn't be getting all of these freebies and things like that. Yeah, I could get behind that. Okay, Bob, let's do one more question here. Uh, just for um, comparison, can you tell us um, what sort of debt countries that are more pure social democracies carry, where they have high taxes on their uh, population that pays for their education, mm -hmm. their health care? Uh, what kind of deficit are those countries? Running? Actually, uh, there are a number of countries that um, have much higher uh, marginal tax rates that are doing pretty well. And uh, one of those is not China. Uh, China has been uh, spending way beyond their means, and they're now beginning to pay a price for it. Uh, I gave you a couple of examples of uh, some of the companies that are in trouble there. But uh, there are many other companies that are faced with uh, bankruptcy if they continue down this path. So it's a mixed picture. There are some countries that uh, have balanced budgets year after year. There are a number of countries that run deficits, but I, anywhere to the extent that we are. And um, uh, that probably puts them in a better situation. And it also explains why the dollar has devalued so much against other currencies. Um, some of these other countries, uh, the, the value of their currency has actually improved considerably versus the U.S. because they don't run these big deficits. Well, in our travels, we've talked to people from various European countries mainly, but um, again, the social democracies like the Scandinavian countries and whatnot, um, and they probably pay a lot less on defense too than we do. That's uh, correct. understandable. 
But uh, I just wondered if you had any idea what sort of deficit those countries ran in, in more highly taxed uh, populations. Uh, not anywhere to the extent we are. They're probably doing better uh, fiscally uh, than we are. I know that uh, some of the Scandinavian countries um, are doing uh, quite well. Um, uh, but you also have some other countries that have some major uh, financial problems as well. But it kind of varies uh, from one uh, place to another. But again, I, I this, uh, the question about here, what do we do? Well, you got to get out in front of people. You got to get out, out in front of legislators and point out the problems that you can't ignore this problem forever. Okay. And uh, uh, you got to write letters. I mean, as much as I get ticked off and not getting a response, I'm going to continue to do it. If I have a chance to get in front of a senator or an elected representative, I can assure you that this is one of the subjects that's going to come up. Okay. Bob, let's let everyone let's say thanks to Bob. It's 2.30 yeah, and you. we need to close it out. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. Oh, I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to mention to you that if you'd like a copy of the slides, if you sign in here and put your email, I'll send you the entire slide presentation. You can look at it on your own. So... Just uh, do that if you'd like to have those. Thank you. Appreciate it.